All right, sorry for the late uh, begin, but again, I, I don't think we're going to be having an issue on time. Just so you know, the last two homeworks are now graded. The solutions are posted, so we're now caught up. Um, 3.3 was due today. How was that? Hopefully that wasn't too bad. Hopefully that was kind of like plug and chug. You know, that was kind of the idea. So in my opinion, you have done really the, the core required skill set in order to solve trusses because what I care about is your ability to solve the entire truss. Um, I am showing you method of sections as a means, uh, uh, really uh, three reasons. To gut check your work, to come up with quick answers for problems, i.e. FE exam. Um, and I do kind of want to show you the method of sections because I want to show you maybe a different way you could approach the two diagonal problem uh, because I'll show you the scissor trust that we did in class last time and how you can utilize the method of sections to solve that trust without a two by two equation solver. So there's, there's a way of doing that scissor trust without breaking out your Casio. Um, I have recorded this lecture already on the virtual work um, uh, uh, method for computing deflections. You have a homework assigned today, due Friday. I am not assigning a homework Friday, due Monday. Okay? So the purpose of this lecture is to get you ready for trust deflections. And I'll go ahead and tell you, it is, uh, it's a little bit like story time. I'm going through the method and explaining how it works. There's some algebra and graphs and whatnot that go along with the lecture. But the way that I did the lecture, I'll go ahead and tell you, the way I did the lecture is, the first thing I do is I just say, okay, here's the method. Then I explain why that's the method, and then I go through it again in a little bit more detail. So if some of the um, like theory and whatnot is like, whoa, what's going on? Obviously, you can rewatch it, but even then, it's a little bit out there, but I want you to just keep in mind that even though the ideas are a little out there, the, con the, the actual application is really, really straightforward and really simple. Basically, what we're doing in order to compute deflections is, and I use a humorous example of uh, Link from Zelda drawing the bow. The idea is that, you know, whenever you deform a structure, you, uh, uh, the structure stores energy, just like a bow. You draw the bow, you're storing energy inside the bow by taking the structure and moving it through a displacement. When you let go of the string, boo, arrow goes, right? So the idea is that if you can quantify the energy inside the bow, and, you know, law of conservation of energy, energy can be created or destroyed, you can say, I know how much energy in the is in the bow, now how much did it have to deflect in order to get that much energy? That's the idea, right? So uh, I go through that sort of process, uh, and we'll use that same concept to compute deflections for trusses, beams, frames, what have you, because it's the one method that works for really any structure. So, uh, but I don't, I mean, that's the whole point of the uh, recorded lecture. I don't want to waste time in here talking about something I've already talked about. So today we're going to talk about the method of sections. So let's recall, you know, the method of joints. Um, and the method of joints uh, is, in my opinion, the simplest. It may be the most tedious, admittedly, but it is the simplest approach to solve the entire truss. Okay? Um, we have our assumptions. All the members are connected by frictionless joints. All the loads and support reactions are applied at the joints. Uh, and in each joint, the centroidal axes coincide. Um, while the uh, uh, tedious, the method of joints will solve the entire structure. One, I guess, disadvantage is that um, the method of joints is limited to joints with at most two unknowns. And I've been saying we're going to explore the method of sections later. Later is going to be in the next 20 seconds. But before I, I get into that, why is the method of joints limited to two unknowns? And you only have two equations, why? When you're looking at a joint, what's the issue with the joint? Why, why are there only two equations? All forces are axial. They're all going through that common point, right? It is a, a particle statics problem, a concurrent force system. All the forces, all the forces are going toward, through a common point. With the method of sections, that's not the case, okay? With the method of sections, we break out that old secret weapon of structural engineering, which is a samurai sword, or a lightsaber if you happen to be a sci-fi fan, uh, and we cut a section through the truss and investigate the equilibrium of the free body diagram on one side. Just like when we cut sections through 
hinges to determine support reactions, we're going to cut sections through the truss in order to determine the internal axial forces inside the members in question. So, um, if I'm cutting a random section, if I'm limited to two unknown members for method of joints, how many truss members do you think I can cut through with the method of sections? It's not two, it's three. Because with the method of sections, because I am now dealing with a non-concurrent force system, I've got forces that, um, uh, uh, that don't all meet at a common point. I can cut a section through at most three unknown member forces. So like I could cut a section through like 12 truss members. I would just have to know nine of the internal forces already, right? And there's no rule about like, does the section have to be a straight line? I mean, I could, I could, woo, you know, do that. That's fine. Um, again, uh, the idea is that um, I'm separating the structure into two components on either side of the section, and I'm cutting through at most three unknowns, okay? So it, the other thing I would mention is that, um, and this is the same thing I mentioned with uh, uh, support reactions, and what I'll just say in general. This structure doesn't care how you analyze it. The answer is the answer, okay? So for example, if I cut a section through this truss, I can look at the free body diagram to the left of the section, or I can cu uh, look, cut and look to the right of the, the, the section. I, if, assuming I do the math correctly, assume I, I uh, perform my computations accurately, I will get the same internal axial forces in member AB, member AH, and member GH. The trust doesn't care which way I look, okay? So I want that to be clear. That being said, just because the trust doesn't care doesn't mean I can't be strategic about uh, how I do my analysis. For example, if I have loads on all of these bottom joints, if I cut a section on this truss, I'd probably look to the left because there's just less stuff over there, less to draw, less to deal with on my equilibrium equations. It's just less room for error, okay? Just because theoretically the structure does not care if I look to the left or look to the right or whatever doesn't mean I need to make my job harder, okay? So there is something to be said about being strategic, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. This is going to be our example today. Um, I have a truss, uh, and first off, this is a, a, um, a, a truss that might be a little bit more emblematic of real life in the sense that, you know, I've got diagonals going every which way at all sorts of different slope ratios. And what we're going to do is focus on CK, CD, and JK, these uh, three members right here. And so, there are two diagonals. I've got a diagonal here and a diagonal here. Um, they're at different slope ratios, okay? I also decided to make the problem a bit interesting by uh, uh, generating a structure with non-symmetric loading conditions. So even though the structure is symmetric, the loads are not. So joints B and C have 20 kips on it, but joints uh, E and F have 30 kips on it. So that's why we have a 45 kip reaction over here and a 55 kip reaction over here, right? There's a little bit more load shimmied on over to the right side of the truss, so the reaction over here is a little bit bigger than the reaction over here on the left. Now, I know that this is a little bit of an uh, artistic exercise for you, so I'd give you a little bit to draft this out if you'd like. Um, I also have it, uh, I'm going to have it on my notebook here in a second. I'll try and give it the college try one more time with connecting, and if it doesn't work, I'll just screen capture it again. Like, let me see if I can do that while you're copying this. Uh, I know that goes over that a bit. I'm sorry. Let me see if it works. And I'll bring it back up. Come on. Big money, big money. No whammy, no whammy, no whammy. Stop. Y'all don't get the reference. All right, I lost my patience. Hold on. All right, I'm going to copy this and put it in the notebook. 
because they're who's clues, blues clues. What's that? V. Oh, I did. Eh, it's all right. That doesn't matter. But no, I didn't intentionally do that. But that ultimately doesn't matter. There we go. So that way we still have the problem here. And I'll just sync it later. Okay, so that way you still you can still keep on copying. But yeah, no, I didn't mean to leave out G. That I didn't even notice that. So, but it doesn't matter. Um, there, it, it's funny you mentioned that because there's actually some uh, different ways of naming um, uh, trust joints. So, what bridge engineers will do, and and I don't do this here in the class because I think it's actually kind of clunky the first time that you learn trusses is what they'll do is they'll call this like L0, L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, and L6 for lower joints. And then they'll call this U1, U2, U3, U4, U5. And it's sort of like a systematic way of naming it so that you're always referring to the same thing. But I don't, I don't like doing that like in class because I think it's really easy to pick up on uh, in the office or in the field. But it just makes for clunky notation when you're first learning how to do trusses and so what you'll find is like you know L joints here you'll find U joints up here so like for lower and upper if you have joints in the middle they might call it M1, M2, M3 and so if you have like a, a bridge that's really really long you might have like this is joint L47 you know uh, in fact I think it was um, uh, the the I-35 bridge that collapsed y'all know what I'm talking about the bridge in uh, Minneapolis collapsed back in the late 2000s. They, the, a lot of the papers, and, and I'm going to get the joint wrong, but they were, it was referring to, you know, like joint, you know, U36 or L36 or whatever. It was referring to it in that, uh, I saw one paper, I think, that referred to it in that notation because that's the systematic way that you would do it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, any questions? Uh, er, question. Yes, sir. Huh. 15 feet, 10 feet, 5 feet, and on the right you have 30 feet as the total length. Yeah. Okay. What? Okay. Yeah, see, I told you I'm dumb. I didn't say that. I did. I was saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I did my Now, come on. I didn't mess up on that. No, it's very possible I could have. No. No, I'm just dumb. I will never say that, okay? <laughs> I thought I was a nice guy, you know, come on. <laughs> all right, does everybody have this? Okay, all right. You aren't going to like me because we're going to do some art uh, on top of this. So, <clears throat> okay. So, since we're doing um, this member, this member, and this member, I think it makes sense to samurai sword and lightsaber uh, right through these members. So we'll call this section 1-1, one, one, okay? So what I'm going to do is below this, I'm going to draw section 1-1. One, one. Now let me ask you a question. Which side do you think is easier to look at or to draw? The left. So we're going to cut section 1-1 one, one and we're going to look to the left. Okay, so now let's test my art skills. So what do we got? And I'm going to cut, sort of do this like right here. So we've got, actually, let's, let's do the notation I've been doing. So that, 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 and then we'll do like that, like that, and then that. Something like that. Okay, this guy. 
Yeah. Okay. So what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to sort of draw the truss kind of like this, this, and this, and then I'm going to have sort of like that, if that makes any sense. So you can kind of see, like, this is where I samurai sorted, and this is what the truss would look like if I were to keep going. Now, what we'll do now is let's place the loads. So this is 20 kips, 20 kips. Um, we have this force here, which is the reaction, which is 45 kips. There's a zero uh, horizontal reaction, so we don't have to worry about that. Let me name the joints. So this is A, I, J, and then this is B, this is C, this is D, um, this is K. Um, and then before I start identifying the uh, unknown member forces, let's put some dimensions on this. So this dimension here, 30 feet. So I'm just going to do that. I think that's close enough. So this is 15 feet, 10 feet, 5 feet. I think that's close enough. And then this dimension here, these are all 30 feet. Okay. All right, now, whenever you're doing a, a method of sections analysis, again, um, you can probably, for a truss like this, you can probably guess what the orientation of the, or sorry, what the um, uh, nature of the uh, 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 internal forces are going to be. Like, I can go ahead and tell you, this one's going to be tension, this one's going to be compression, but whenever you're um, unsure, I think, assume tension positive okay so we'll call this force right here CD okay we'll call this force right here CKX CKY and we'll call this force right here J, K, X, J, K, Y. And again, a, a tension means they're yanking away from the joints in question. Okay? And then I'm going to sneak this in here. One to six, one to one. Right? Because this diagonal is out of one to one because it goes over 30 and up 30. And this diagonal is out of 1 to 6 because it goes over 30, but only up 5. Okay? Does this make sense? Now, it might look like, hey, Dr. Mike, why would you shove the truss all the way over here? Well, I'm going to show you why. Now, let's be clear. How many bars did I cut through? Three. I cut through three bars because I can only deal with at most three unknowns. Why three unknowns? Because I have three equations of equilibrium. Okay? So let's talk about those three equations of equilibrium. I have sum of forces in the x direction. Should I do that one first? No. Sum of forces in the x direction? I'd say no, because I've got one, two, three unknowns I'm dealing with. Like I could do it, but I'd have a bunch of unknowns and I wouldn't, it wouldn't isolate anything. What about sum of forces in the y direction? 
probably shouldn't do that one first either because I've got an unknown component here, unknown component here. That's two unknowns. But what about sum of moments? Now, first off, hold on. Let's just use a little bit of common sense here. The method of joints gives us only two equations of equilibrium. Sum of forces in the x direction, sum of forces in the y direction, right? Well, we just cut a section. Why did we cut a section? So we'd have a third equation. What's the third equation? Sum of those. Probably you ought to use that one first, right? That's the whole point in doing it. Now, where do we sum moments, okay? Well, remember, whenever you're summing moments, you try and be strategic, right? You try and sum moments at a location that isolates, or that, that elim not isolates, eliminates as many unknowns as possible. So, let me ask you a question. What would happen if I summed moments at C? If I sum moments at C, I would eliminate two unknowns. Now, some of you are saying you'd eliminate three, but remember, these two are related, right? They're not independent, right? If you know one, you can solve for the other. If you know one, you can solve for the other. So if I summed moments at C, this one and this one would be eliminated, and I could solve for this member directly, right? So I just want to see if everybody's paying attention. But there are three options where you could sum moments. I propose one of them is joint C. Somebody give me another joint that, about which you could sum moments. K. K. Because this diagonal and this diagonal would, would go through K and I could solve for CD. So joint K. Does anybody know the third point? I'll show you. I'm going to cheat a little bit. The third point... is right there because this member and this member intersect right there I'm curious if anybody knows how far that distance is what's that Walmart, Walmart. <laughs> it's Walmart <laughs> that's a good one remember this is a rise and run of 1 over 6 so from here to here, we go down 30 over 180. So that distance is 90. Y'all see that? Relax, I'm not going to make you do that. Okay? But we could call this, I don't know, point X. And so you could sum moments out there and it would work. I'm just wanting you to like see it. I'm not making you do it. All right. But do you all see that? The more that you see, the best you would do. Now, so I propose that there are two like real options for this problem. Joint C or joint K. Is there a reason why we would pick one over the other? Well, okay. Let me talk about that. Okay. So he's saying you're looking left. We already did look left, okay, when we cut the section and drew this component. In terms of summing moments, I can sum moments here, 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 Walmart, it doesn't matter, okay? The looking left was taken care of by exercising the free body diagram. So I want, what I, what I don't want you to feel restricted about is just because we cut a section and look left, you can sum moments here, here, that's not the problem. That's not the issue. That's a good point, though, and I want, I want you to be, what I, what I don't want you to see, for you to feel hampered that because I cut a section and look left, I can only sum moments over here. That's not a problem. Let's use our thinking caps. 
if I summed moments at k, I would solve for this, right? But then that would leave two diagonals, right? Then I'd have to do all that simultaneous equation crap in the Casio, right? Whereas if I sum moments at C, I'll solve these. Then I can use sum of verticals to get that, slope ratio to get that, and then sum forces in the x direction. It's just easier to sum moments at C. Does that make sense? That's what I want you to recognize. Be strategic about it, okay? So that's what we're going to do. All right, so let me scroll down a little bit. We'll do that. Okay, so we're going to sum moments at C. And let's see what we can get. So if we're summing moments at C, do I consider CKX and CKY? Yeah. No. Do I consider CD? Yeah. Do I consider this 20 kips? Yeah. Do I consider that 20 kips? Yeah. Do I consider that 45 kips? Yeah. Okay, so let's do the 45 kips. Which side of the table, if I'm at C, left or right? Left times the moment arm of? 60 feet. 60 feet. So 45 times 60, 20 times what? 30. Left or right? Right. So 45 times 60 on the left, 20 times 30 on the right. Does that make sense? You okay with that? Okay. Now what's going on with this JKX and JKY? We can solve for those, but how? How do we do that? Okay, I'm going to remind you of some little uh, principle that either I taught you in statics or somebody else taught you in statics called the principle of transmissibility. Do you all remember that? What the principle of transmissibility states is that, hold on, let's do this. I'll just do it like this. I know I'm going to grab more than I want. But the principle of transmissibility states that a force, whenever you're summing moments, can be moved along its line of action, and you're going to get the same contributing moment, right? So I can take these X and Y components and I can, you know, do 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 I can move them anywhere along that line of action. So what I think would make sense is to put them right there. Why would it make sense to put them right there? Because the vertical component is going right through C. Does that make sense? So hold on. So basically what I'm saying is that component is going like right here through and then JKX is, is going to be put at J. So if I move those right here, what goes in here? Do I consider JKX or JKY? JKX. All right, which side, left or right? Times a moment arm of? No. 25. There you go. Does that make sense? So basically what I'm doing is I'm saying that they're going right here. Right? So you can put them at Walmart if you want as long as maybe that's Walmart, right? Because that's along that line of action. That's a great point. So if you put it at Walmart, the X component would go through, and then you'd have the Y component times like 150 feet. Make sense? And think about it. It's either JKX times 25 or JKY times 150. What's 150 divided by 25? 6. What's the slope ratio? 1 to 6. So that's why it matches, right? Does that make sense? So, we've got a 
<coughs> plus 45 times 60. 45 times 60 is... That is 600. What's JKX going to be? Negative what? 84. Negative 84. Which means it's 84 kips going in what direction? What's that? Left, yeah. Okay, I'm going to stop for a second and see if this makes sense. Everybody okay with this? Because if you understand this, the rest is, is going to be pretty cookie cutter. Are we good? All right. So, whenever you get JKX, or whenever you get the component of a diagonal, you should be able to compute the other component directly. So, JKY is going to be what? I'm going to take JKX and multiply it by what? One sixth. Because the Y component's tiny. And so what's 84 times a sixth? Or 84 divided by six? 14. What direction? Down. All right, let me do that. I'll do that. Does that make sense? So now, the way I've got this shown on the screen, those are my unknowns. Tell me what I should do now. Some forces in the Y. Some forces in the Y. I'm summing forces in the Y because I've got two horizontals, one vertical. Deal with the vertical first, right? So we'll sum forces in the Y direction. So 45 up, 25 or 20 down. 20 down, I've got C, K, Y going up. Am I forgetting anything? J, K, Y. And I know it's 14 going down, so I'll just put it over here and say J, K, Y is 14 kips. If not, you could look at your diagram. Some of you are looking at your diagram. You go, well, I've got it going up. Don't I need to put it on the upside? Sure, put it on the upside, but it's got to be negative 14 because your assumption was incorrect. So... Either one will work. So, so CKY plus 45 is 20 and 20 is 40, 54. CKY is positive 9. 9 kips going up. And so if that's 9 kips going up, what do I do? CKX is 9 because the slope ratio on the CK is 1 to 1. So, again, whenever you get the diagonal or the component of a diagonal, do the other. Let's see CK. And which direction for CKX? Right. right. And it's right because we assumed right and we got a positive answer here, which means that's the correct assumption. So, to the right. We all know what to do now. Summing forces in the X direction. I got CD to the right. I've got CKX, 9 kips to the right. And then I've got JKX, 84 kips to the left. So 84 kips to CD plus What is CD? Sorry, that's not nine. What is 75. 75. 
and it is 75, it's positive 75, let's not skip that. I'm going to leave this here for a sec and see if you've got any questions, because we'll summarize everything at the end. Any questions? This isn't bad, right? Pretty straightforward. Do you have all this? Can I scroll up or, or move this up a little bit? Okay. So the only thing left to do is to say I've got CK is the square root of CKX squared plus CKY squared, which is... Um, the square root of 9 kips squared plus 9 kips squared, which I think by this point you can do that, and you get 12.73 kips. And then JK is JKX squared plus JKY squared, which is... Um, X was 84. This was 14. And if you notice, I'm not bothering with positives or negatives. Why? Because I'm taking the values and squaring it, right? We're just computing magnitude, so it doesn't matter. And so when you chug this one out, you get 85.16. So CD... C, K, J, K equals, so C, D is 75, this one's 12.73, this one's 85.16, and the only thing left is to identify which ones are tension or compression, and they're all in tension except one of them, which one's not in tension, J, K, so tension, tension, compression. I'm going to stop for a second and see if this makes sense. Anybody have any questions on this? Everybody good? Started late, ended five minutes early. That's all I've got, everybody. Uh, I will see you all on Monday. You all have a wonderful few days. We'll see you when you get back. Don't forget, you have uh, exam review on Wednesday. And a celebration on Friday. <laughs> Let me uh, stop the recording and I will uh, pull this back up in case anybody's still writing. <laughs>